Just look and smile and look at a shoestring, remember the country of Chile. It's long and skinny. Now each country of the world has something that represents it. And Canada has something too that hangs on a pole and flies in the wind. What's it called? A flag. And when a Canadian goes anywhere in the world and sees a flag up somewhere, they say, oh, Canada, right? Well, I was born in Canada, but I've lived most of my life in the United States. And so when I see the American flag somewhere, I say, I'm an American, I'm proud. Well, each flag has something that it represents, right? I'm not sure what the Canadian flag represents. Can you, anyone tell me what the maple leaf stands for? For the maple leaves. The red maple. And is there any particular? <laughs> province, provinces and territories. How many of you know what the, the United States flag looks like? It's got stars and stripes, and it has 50 stars. Why does it have 50 stars? 50 states. So each country has a, something that represents it. And I brought this morning the Chilean flag, which I'm going to have to stand up to show you. And you know, when we go to a different country, we tell the boys and girls and moms and dads about Jesus. And did you know that I can use the Chilean flag to tell people about Jesus? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it carefully. Red. What does red stand for usually? Okay. Besides, I'm long and skinny, okay. so you don't remember thinking <laughs> yeah, chilly. <laughs> what does red usually remind us of? Okay, but red usually represents what? Blood. Why do you think chili has red in its flag? You probably don't know. Well, Chile belonged to the Indians at first, the Mapuche Indians and different ones. And then the Spanish people came over and they said, we want your country. And so what did they do? They fought. So a lot of people had to lay down their lives. They were killed protecting what they wanted to belong to them, their country. So this represents the blood of the soldiers that were killed to keep Chile um, independent. Now, what would white stand for? When you think of white, what do you think of? They, yeah, that's true. Some are white. Purity is another thing. What's up in the sky? Clouds. What's up on the mountains? Snow. And you know that um, Chile is a long country, and all across the border, all the way down here, are the Andes Mountains. And the Andes Mountains are covered with snow all year round. So the white represents the snow, the purity of the mountains. Blue. What does blue use? What, when you think of blue, what do you think of? The sky. Sky? What else? You've got it all around you here because you're living on an island. Water. Water. And chili, look at all the water it is <coughs> all the way down to here. So this represents the blue sky and the ocean waters. Now what would the star, what do you think the star would represent? The sky. There's stars in the sky, aren't they, that shine at night? Well, I think the star for Chile represents we are the greatest. We are the greatest. And the Chilean people are very proud of their country. And they like to think that they're the best country in all of South America. So they say we are a shining star. OK, let's look at it again. If I was to tell boys and girls about the Lord Jesus Christ, I would first of all talk about the red, which means what? The blood. OK, and what blood would I be talking about? The soldiers? No. The blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ loves the Chilean boys and girls. And he came from heaven to do what? Die on the cross and shed his blood so the boys and girls could go to heaven. But first of all, their hearts have to be washed clean, right? Because the Bible says that all have sinned. And that means that we can't go to heaven if we have a heart that's full of sin. But Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, so that he could wash our hearts clean and white, so that we could go to heaven. And the star, Jesus says that we are like stars. We're supposed to shine in a dark world. That means if you know Jesus Christ and have asked him to come into your heart, you are to be a shining star and to represent him to all your friends. 
your friends at school so that you can tell them about Jesus so that they can come to know him and go to heaven and live with him. So remember, red, white, and blue. And if you know Jesus Christ, you're a star that's supposed to shine in a dark world so that others will know Jesus Christ. Yeah. 40 horse Johnson motor on it. And we got out with a tent. We set the tent up and get about 100 people inside. And uh, we have these meetings for every night of the week. We go out during the day and invite the farmers and the people to come in. And we have evangelistic meetings, teach them Bible verses, preach the gospel. To do our cooking, we had a little propane bottle and uh, would heat water and cook on top of that for our meals. And we ran out of propane. And so I was elected to go back to port to the other island to get a new propane bottle or get it filled. I got in that open boat and went home. It was beautiful weather. Got there, spent the night in our house and got the propane bottle, put it in the boat, and uh, headed down back to the island. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, clear skies, just blue, beautiful out across the water. But we have a tide that uh, runs between the islands out there, and uh, it just happened that the tide was going down at that time, and out in that strait there was a, a south wind blowing against it. And it just stacked those waves up crazy. I mean, they're not like normal waves on a sea. They're just breaking every which way. I ran into the middle of that with that open boat without knowing what was coming. White caps. And uh, I was, the water started coming over the side, so I thought I'd put my rain gear on. So I'm trying to pull these, these rain pants up to keep from getting drenched. And there's cold water down there. There are penguins in the water down there, the little short guys. And, uh, and, and I'm trying to get those rain clothes on, and all of a sudden I hear the motor just really sing. And what happened was, it was like a banana boat, and when it go over one of those crazy waves, a prop would come out in the air, and it just revved the motor. And I was afraid it's going gonna, it's gonna to rev, and it's going to hit the water, it's going to shear the pin off, and I'm going to be sitting out there without any power, and then I'll swamp, and down I'll go, and the crabs will eat me. And so, and so I'm trying to slow the motor down. Every time the prop comes out, I slow the motor down. You turn the handle, you know, slow the engine down. And then about that time, I hear this big thump, thump. And there's this 15 kilo propane bottle up in the front of the boat. And every time we go over a wave, it goes up in the air and down it comes. And these, these are just thin wood boats, you know, thin boards. And I'm thinking, how many times before it goes right through the bottom? And uh, so I've got the rain gear up here. There's some cross benches to get to that balloon. I can't turn loose of the motor. But what I did was I just confessed all my sins. Right <laughs> and I survived. Uh, you know, you don't have to go to the mission field to run into troubles, do you? No, you got plenty of troubles right here. I don't see any difference as far as job work. Mission work is hard work. You guys do hard work, too. I've seen some of it yesterday. And uh, that's what mission work is all about. Whether you're here, you know, the whole plan, God's plan of missions, you know where it starts? It starts with the local church. It starts right here. You want to know where the engine for missions is all about? The engine for missions, for doing God's purpose, is right here, right here in Westside, in the local church. That's where it all begins. This is the hub. Everything that's done out there are just spokes. It's all right here. You let this die, and there won't be anything out there. There won't be anything. In other words, God's chosen the local church to be His divine instrument for spreading the gospel around the world so that other boys and girls, men and women, come to know Christ as Savior. And uh, I'm just grateful. I grew up across the water over here, west of Port Angeles. I'm grateful that somebody took the gospel to that community and built a little church there that would preach the, the Lord Jesus Christ, preach God's Word, and as a child, I came to know Christ there because of Sunday school teachers who had lots of patience <laughs> and Bible club teachers who had lots of patience and would teach us God's Word. And I'm just so grateful for that. And all that we're doing down in the mission field is exactly a repetition of what you folks are doing right here. And we just thank you once again for your participation. And the only greater joy we could have is that God would raise up someone right from this congregation and send them out to carry the gospel to another part of God's world. And uh, that people might come to know Christ. And repeat what you're doing right here. That, I think that's the greatest joy for a church. To be able to send one of their very own, one of your sons, one of your daughters, one of your granddaughters, one of your grandsons, or one of you that would just feel the Lord's call 
Well, prepare yourself and study God's Word and prepare so you can teach others and then the church send you out. That's a wonderful thing. That's God's plan. That's what we see in the New Testament. What I'd like to share this morning is just something how the Lord speaks to my own heart. And in the book of uh, Mark, chapter 14, uh, this is, I was listening to a sermon and, and a verse came out of this portion that really spoke to my heart. And I begin to apply it to my own life. I'm still applying it to my own life. I don't pretend to, to have fulfilled it or carried it out, but the Lord speaks to me. I'd like to share it with you this morning as well. I'll just read the first eight verses of Mark chapter 14. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they, but they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he said at me, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke break the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred pence, and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will, you will do them good. But me ye not, have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. And the and this phrase that stayed with me here is, she hath done what she could. Let's pray. Our Father, again, we thank you for this Sunday morning. We thank you for each brother and sister in Christ that have come this day to worship you, sing these wonderful hymns and choruses, and to give testimony and pray, Lord, and teach Sunday school class. We thank you for each one. We just thank you that you are doing a great work in this place. We ask that you continue, Lord, to speak to our hearts. Bless the children as they're downstairs, and Lord, may they learn principles that are eternal for their lives, that will be a light unto their path, will guide them in ways that please you and glorify your name, and lead them to happiness. Father, we thank you again for your Holy Spirit that you've given to us. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This, this lady did a wonderful thing for our Lord, and yet what she did was very costly, and it seemed to be lavish and out of place. In the Old Testament, there's a story of uh, David and his, uh, his warriors. They were kind of mercenaries. They protected Israel from the Philistines and other people that would raid their crops. And David, it says, was up in a uh, cave in a hill above the well of, of Bethlehem. And he longed in his heart for that cold water down there. He's up there in the dry desert, thirsty uh, on the hill. And down there he remembers what the water tasted like. And it says he longed for that water, a uh, drink of that water from the well in Bethlehem. And three of these fellows, I think they probably were a bit like Rambo style, they went down the hill and they, they went to the line of the Philistines and they drew water out of that well and they brought it back up there and they gave it to David. And I don't know how many people died in the process, but those guys obviously were serious fellows in what they were about. But the thing that struck me on that story of David and these three fellows was David took that water and he recognized that they had put their lives in jeopardy to bring that drink to him and he wouldn't drink it. And he poured it out to the Lord. And I learned something from that. The Lord Jesus Christ, he deserves that type of sacrifice, but no man deserves that much sacrifice just to satisfy his thirst. But our God, our God, he deserves that kind of sacrifice. And David did the right thing. He knew who deserved to put, that someone would put their life in jeopardy. And uh, this woman is kind of in keeping with that. She loved the Lord, and she took something that was probably the most valuable thing that she owned, and she poured it out one time on her Lord. And the Lord accepted that. The Lord accepted that, just like He will accept any type of sacrifice that we do for Him. And I tried to think, this term, she had done what she could. It belonged to her. Nobody could tell her, you can't do that. It was her privilege. It was something that belonged to her, and she took it and she poured it out. And the Lord says, she hath done what she could. 
And I began to think about in the book of Acts, which is the New Testament, the beginning of the local church and how the gospel spread. I began to think about different people there and how they did things that they could for the Lord. And I'm afraid in our generation that we live in today, most people think, I can't do very much for the Lord because I don't have any money. And uh, I, I went to the book of Acts, and right away in chapter 3 and verse 7 of the book of Acts, we see that money isn't the only thing that can be used for doing great things for the Lord. In fact, the man here who was lame, in Acts chapter 3, uh, lame from birth, uh, he was expecting that uh, Peter and John would give him some money. I suppose even a dollar would have been sufficient for him. Uh, it was just whatever they could give. And uh, he was expecting them to give him something like that. But what Peter and John didn't have was money. Silver and gold. They didn't have any money on them. I can recognize that. I've had times when I didn't have any money on me either. But he didn't, they didn't have any money to give to him. Oh, so I can't do anything for the Lord. That wasn't the way with Peter and John. Peter and John says, But such as we have, give we unto thee. In other words, and this is a neat illustration. He put down his hand and took a hold of him and raised him up. There's some real involvement. Uh, yesterday afternoon, your pastor up here on the roof with a with a tar brush. <laughs> There's some hands on, <laughs> and then the ladies, some of you uh, preparing meals and things like that, and all those cookies and good things. There's some hands on. There's some hands on. No money in the case of Peter and John, but what they did have. And the second thing here was they prayed for him, and in the name of the Lord asked that God would raise him up, and God answered their prayer and did that. You know, that is one of the greatest ministries. I heard yesterday someone talking about having prayed for somebody, and what an impact that had on their lives. You know, how much money do we need to pray for somebody? How much money does it take for us to bow our head and pray for somebody? And yet, the whole mighty power of God is, just, is at our availability there for those that pray. Uh, I consider myself very privileged to have people that pray for us on a regular basis. Maybe some of you people here pray for us. And you know, God answers <coughs> prayer. You may not see it, but let me tell you something. We know it. We know it. God keeps us. He keeps us steady on. He provides for us. He gives us wisdom when we're just not, not with it. He protects us. He watches over us. People are praying for you. It's a wonderful thing to have people praying for you. And uh, the Bible tells us as a church to pray one for another. That's what God wants us to do. How much money does it take? How much money do we have to have in our pocket to pray for each other? It's a wonderful ministry, you know. We can, she has done what she could. She did what she could. We can do what we can with prayer as well. I think it's a wonderful thing to pray for our unsaved relatives. I think it's a wonderful thing to pray for missionaries that go overseas. I think it's a wonderful thing to pray for your pastor, for your church leaders, especially uh, new men coming on. Pray for them. Hold them up before the throne of God's throne of grace, that God will keep them and give them power and wisdom. Prayer doesn't take money. Go back to ch uh, Acts chapter 2. And verse 14, here's another thing that doesn't take money. Uh, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, by this no, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. What did Peter do here? He used his, his voice. How much money did Peter need to stand up there and preach that day when thousands came to know Christ as Savior? They didn't take money. He didn't have gold and silver, but he did a great work for the Lord. This lady did what she could for the Lord. And I think that's what God wants each one of us to do too. Do what we can for the Lord. And sometimes it's as simple as bowing our knee and praying for somebody. When we were in the islands, I had a, a, an island fellow who came to know Christ, and he taught me some real lessons. We could, I learned more on the mission field than I ever taught anybody. 
And I, he would go out, we would go hiking over the, the islands and there you just have trails. You come to a fence, you jump the fence, you cut across wheat fields or grain fields, potato patches, anywhere. The trails get too muddy. You know the horses sink right down to their bellies, they get stuck. The rider has to get out and you'll see him pull it, trying to pull the horse out of the mud hole. That's how bad it is. So it's better to jump the fence and walk across the fields. And then in the summertime, of course, it all turns to dust and just billows up and covers you. See the whites of your eyes. And uh, you get to a home there, and it's a custom that the people will invite you in and serve you a cup of tea or a mate, uh, something to drink, maybe some kind of a fried uh, bread dough or some sort of thing. And uh, this fellow taught me a lesson. The first thing you do when they serve you something like that is not eat it, but you ask them if you can pray for it, as it's your custom to give thanks to God. And the people down there, they're glad to have you do it. And uh, he would, of course, pray for more than just the food. He would pray for the souls of the mom and dad and the kids, the whole family, that they would come to know Christ as Savior. It's just, it, it doesn't take money to pray for people. You can pray for people. I think more hearts are changed that way often when we pray for people than when we even invest our funds. And of course, then we go on to Acts chapter 4. And you have Barnabas, and he's the opposite. He's got a property. Like this lady, he has something that's very valuable, that's precious to him. He takes it and, and, and brings the money and, and puts it at the disposal of the apostles to use for the Lord's work. Now, you can tell uh, Barnabas, did he have to do that? No. Somehow, the love of God, the same as this lady, she has this perfume, this ointment of great value. She brings it and pours it out on the Lord. Did she have to do it? No. She had done what she could. And Barnabas, he did what he could. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, by the way, they got mixed up there. And uh, they wanted the praise of men. So they lied about what they did and brought some money. And they got in big trouble. And the Lord took them home. He just took them out like that. And, uh, but Barnabas did it right. He had something that belonged to him. He could do with it as he chose. And he chose to sell it. And he brought it and he put it there. And uh, I, I knew a missionary... His name was Dale Thompson, no relative of mine, but uh, he was, he had a nice Chevy pickup. It was, it was almost a new Chevy pickup. He used it in the work to get from one place to the other, preaching and working in southern Chile. But there was a church in Palinacas, it's a town, a suburb of Temuco, Chile. They had a new chapel, but they had no pastor's home. They needed a parsonage to be able to call a Chilean pastor to carry on the work there. And uh, Dale knew about that. And... Uh, he sold his van, brought the money, and purchased the pastor's house right beside the church. And uh, they were able to call their pastor, and that's, that's a growing church, and going there today. Very few people knew what he did. But the thing I knew about it was, was that Daryl needed to pick up. Why in the world does he sell his only means of transportation? Why does he sell that thing and buy that parsonage for that church set? Now, I don't have the answer today. Why does a person do that? Well, it belonged to him. Could he do it? He did what he did. Simple as that. She has a, that vase full of ointment, precious. She did what she could. She poured it out on the Lord for his burials, I think, as the Lord said. She did what she could. We can do things lavishly for the Lord, brethren. We don't have to hold back on that. We don't have to. You know, the people got angry at this lady. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? People got angry with this lady because of what she did for the Lord. Here, the creator of all the world, there was nothing created without him creating it in all the universe. He's sitting there before and she pours out what was valuable to her, but was just a, a little bit of all the possessions in the world that he had created. She pours that out on him and people get angry with it. Let me tell you, today it'll happen too. You pour out your life and people can get angry with you for doing it. They think you're kind of fanatic. I had a fellow, he lived, I even showed a side of it, it didn't come out of it, he lived down in an awful hole, a little tiny house, about so big, eight people living in the home, dirt floor, you move the chain, the pot up the chain for cold, down the chain for hot, just a fire going right there, and um, Antonio Chihuahua was his name. He was a Christian. He knew the Lord. I would go down there and have home Bible studies in his home. He considered me his pastor. And so every year he would give me his time. 
He would save it for the whole year and give me his tithe. And it was quite a sum of money. Very poor, let me tell you. All those eight people sleeping on the benches around that one room there. That's where they lived. That was the whole house. But he would give me his tithe. And I said, Don Antonio, why don't you come down to the local church across the island? And why don't you give your tithes through the church? So it goes in the church registry book. And you know what he said to me? He said, if I do that, he said, it'll make the people there angry because they're, they're, they're stingy. They don't get. You know, he had it right. I believe he was right. I believe those people would have been angry if they would have seen that large amount of money that he, bring, that he brought to give to the Lord. And uh, they did the same thing with this lady. They just got angry and indignant with her that she would waste that on the Lord. Oh, they sure had it wrong. Waste that on the Lord, the creator of all the universe, the one who died and gave his life for our lives? No. We can do things lavishly for the Lord. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to do something <laughs> lavish for the Lord, but I just challenge you, as this lady, do what you can for the Lord. This other example, Stephen, of course, comes in, in, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 59. And you know Stephen, he was a man that says in chapter 6, full of wisdom, honest report, and full of the Holy Spirit. But, but Stephen, what did Stephen give? Does, can anybody tell me what Stephen gave to the Lord? His life. His life. Is it alright for us to lay down our lives for the Lord? It's acceptable. You see what I mean? It's not too much. And when you think of sending your sons, or your daughters, or your granddaughters, your grandsons, out to the mission field, and they may be put in harm's way, and something may happen, is that wrong if they're serving the Lord? Not at all. Not at all. It's completely in keeping that we would willingly yield our lives, as, as Fred has already said today, present our bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord. If the Lord takes us home, where we belong to the Lord, we are purchased with the price. It's okay. We can be lavish in that way. And uh, the same way here, I, I know some of you uh, invest your lives by the sweat of your brow in the Lord's work. It's okay. That's okay. That's, some people may think you're a fanatic. It's all right. Let them think that way. But for the Lord, He understands that perfectly. And one day, we're going to give account to Him, not to the other people. We give account to our Lord, the one who gave his life for us. I think it's wonderful what Stephen did. I don't think Stephen had a plan, but I believe God had a plan. And Stephen just was obedient to his Lord. And he spoke boldly for the Lord. It cost him his life. But the church grew and spread, spread out everywhere. Then we have after him what I feel is like the area of missions is Philip. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. And, and Philip... Philip was willing to go. The Lord sent him down to that desert to, to meet the Ethiopian. Philip was willing to go. And uh, of course we have Paul in Acts chapter 16. And that He hears that. He sees a vision of the man over in Macedonia saying, come over and help us. And Paul had other plans. He was going a different direction. But he dropped his own plans and he went over to Europe and carried the gospel to Europe. And because of that today we have the gospel. Because he took the gospel to Europe. And uh, brethren, that's, that's another area. We, not all of us can go. Not all of us can go, but some of us can. She hath done what she could. She hath done what she could. And in that way of going, I believe it's the same way. Not all can go, but some can go. Some can get their Bible training and sell out for the Lord 100% and go across the world and take the gospel to another culture, to another language, to another people that need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it was wonderful to see the, the, the children here this morning uh, learning God's Word and uh, what they're doing downstairs. But you know, most of the children in the whole world today know nothing of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're six billion people today on the face of the earth, there are probably at least five billion that don't know anything of Christ as their personal Savior. Five billion people? I can't even imagine it. But let me tell you, it's a great large majority. I, I got in a taxi in Chile uh, not too many long ago, and, and I, the taxi was taking us into town, and I saw two pictures up on the dashboard of the taxi of two boys. 
And I asked the driver if those were his children. He said, yes. And he says, I'm having an awful problem with him. He said, raising him. And he was a young fellow, probably in his 20s or 30s. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, do you teach him the Bible? And it just opened up and gave me an opportunity to witness. You know, when I got done witness to him, sharing to him about what, I, what we would teach our children from God's Word to respect and obey their parents, I asked him, I said, anybody ever talk to you about the gospel before? He said, it's the first time anybody ever. Here he is, 30 years old. No one's ever explained to him the gospel before. Most of the world's like that. Most of the world's like that. And, uh, and the Lord has told us to go and preach the gospel so that people can come to know Christ as Savior. And I'm, I'm grateful for what the Lord is calling out of people for himself from around the world, from every, every different country in the world. The Lord is calling out that everywhere I go, I see just a dearth of workers. You know, Jesus Christ said, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors. That, that hasn't changed in all these years. There's still such a, such a vast need out there for people to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I just think it's a wonderful thing that Paul and uh, Philip, they did what they could for the Lord. They did what they could for the Lord. And God blessed it, God prospered it, and we heard the gospel as a result of it. And it's a wonderful thing to know that uh, we can do what we can for the Lord as well. And I really, I long to, I know I haven't done it in my life. I know there's so much more that I can do for the Lord. And uh, I tend to clutch to things too. I tend to slack back when I should be running hard for the Lord. And uh, my prayer is that uh, the Lord will continue to help me to be diligent to do what I can for the Lord. And I don't mind doing things lavishly and out of place for the Lord. If there's anyone we should spend and overspend for and sacrifice our lives for, it's our God and our Savior. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again for your loving kindness to us. We thank you for the gospel that was brought to us through your word and to faithful servants who were bold to preach and teach us and they sacrificed and gave that they might, even these Sunday school teachers, Bible club teachers as well. And Father, we just pray today 